focus on headline. And let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. For this, our reporters Kwon Zhuan and Che Ji-hee joins us in the studio. Guys, welcome back to the studio. Good evening. We're going to start things off. You guys are like twins today, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> the, the good evenings and the, the new laptops and uh, everything today. But uh, good to see you guys back in the studio. Uh, let's, guys, let's begin with the uh, local politics today. Uh, the big news, President like Yoon seok having met with former President Park Geun-hye and Daegu this Tuesday. The meeting received a lot of spotlight because, uh, for our listeners out there, a bit of a backstory. Yoon was the one who led the investigation into former president uh, that resulted in her impeachment. Nevertheless, uh, so I'll start us off with this. Sure. So President-elect Yoon Seok-yeol held a roughly 50-minute meeting with former President Park Geun-hye at her residence in the southeastern city of Daegu in Dalsong County this afternoon. Park has been staying in her hometown after she had been discharged from hospital late last month and following the granting of a special pardon by the Moon administration late last year. Now, ever since uh, former president, uh, former prosecutor general Yoon was elected as next president, there was a lot of speculations on whether he will have a one-on-one with the ex-president as Yoon and Park's relationship could only be described as ill-fated, as it was Yoon who led the probe into Park and her confidant uh, Choi Soon-sil in 2016 that uncovered a vast amount of corruptions linked to the former president. But uh, as Yoon had been recently mentioning a number of times, he felt sorry for what he had to do back then. And that's what he also seems to have conveyed in the meeting today, as he told reporters that he expressed his regret on a personal level and that uh, deep inside he felt sorry for Park, referring to the history they had. Park reportedly did not make any specific comments regarding these uh, remarks. Yoon also said they talked about the former president's health and her whereabouts at the place Place she's living now. Now, Kwon Young Se, vice chairman of Yoon's transition committee, and Yu Young Ha, Park's close aide who defended her as her lawyer during the corruption probes, attended the meeting. And uh, according to um, Kwon, the 50 minute meeting seemed to be uh, done in a very amicable environment. And uh, also, although there are uh, many things that they cannot disclose to the public, uh, he wished they could. That's how the atmosphere, uh, how positive it was. Now, what was mentioned, though, is that Yoon felt regrets towards some great policies or achievements by the ex-president that could no longer be credited for. With that, Yoon vowed to promote her earlier policies and help in recover her honor. And Park thanked Yoon for that. Now, Yoon also invited Park to his inauguration ceremony on the 10th of May, and she replied to try to attend if possible. Yoon's encounter with Park, meanwhile, comes as he started his nationwide tour to thank the nation's people for their support, as well as to look into ways to help different regions based on their needs. And he kicked off his tour in the conservative stronghold, the southeastern part of the country. That's why also this uh, meeting with Park was held this Tuesday. That's right. Uh, nevertheless, uh, President-elect Yoon suk inauguration ceremony less than a month away. Uh, presidential inauguration or inaugural committee announcing some plans regarding the day, including the fact that uh, normal citizens, uh, the ordinary people, will be able to apply uh, to attend the ceremony. If you've ever watched the inauguration ceremony uh, in the United States, uh, normally you are allowed to to attend if you, I guess, get the, the, the space and whatever. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, let's talk about this upcoming inauguration. Uh, Jihee, tell us more about this. Mm-hmm. So for President-elect Yoon Sagar's inauguration ceremony slated for May 10th, citizens can apply to attend online. And the application began last Friday and will continue until April 14th, which is two days from now. Uh, those who are randomly selected to attend will be announced on the 29th of this month. And according to the inaugural committee, uh, politicians, international diplomats, and key figures from various industries will also be invited to the ceremony. Uh, Meanwhile, the invitation of BTS for a congratulatory 
Factory performance was canceled with much controversy that the world famous Korean boy band was being used for political purposes. Uh, and also whether former President Park Geun-hye will attend the ceremony, uh, not yet confirmed yet. And the ceremony will begin with a bell ringing at Boshingak Pavilion in central Seoul at midnight on May 10th. And the ceremony will be divided into the morning and afternoon sessions uh, so that the ceremony day will be devoted wholly to the people of the country so that they can truly feel that a new era will begin with a new administration. Uh, The morning session will reportedly be the main ceremony of Yoon's inauguration in the front yard of the National Assembly. And the afternoon session includes events for the country's key figures as well as guests from abroad. And the inaugural committee also explained that the slogan of the upcoming ceremony is, uh, again, Korea, a new country of the people. And the emblem that they're using is a traditional pattern called Dongshimgyeol, which is a Korean traditional knot, uh, and it symbolizes promise. So this implies the idea of the new administration's determination and promise for a new country. Uh, a pre-ceremony will also be held before the actual inauguration day, and this will be held at the end of this month in Yongsan Park, which is the same area President-elect Yoon is pushing to relocate the presidential office. Uh, the pre-ceremony includes an event called Children's Dream Drawing and the People's Video Footage Participation event, and opinions received from this uh, event from citizens will be used as the main content for the actual inauguration ceremony. Interesting. I wonder if anybody could send in videos uh, and send in opinions as well. Uh, Yoon is expected to announce the selection of key cabinet members for his uh, government tomorrow. Uh, We do have, I believe uh, he's about halfway done, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. He selected about uh, nearly a half uh, of his new cabinet members. But uh, nevertheless, let's get the details of this. Right, so Yoon has already announced the Prime Minister nominee Han Dok Su uh, on the 3rd of the month and eight ministerial nominees on Sunday as well. And those for the remaining 10 ministerial positions will be announced tomorrow. Uh, the names are expected to be announced directly by the president elect, and they include figures for the ministries of education, foreign affairs, unification, justice, safety and interior, labor, SMEs and startups, uh, maritime affairs, agriculture, and environment. Uh, Prime Minister nominee Han reportedly handed Yoon a list of candidates for uh, of recommendation in line with Yoon's pledge to give greater authority to the Prime Minister in naming cabinet members. Uh, the leading nominee for the Education Minister and Deputy Prime Minister is Seoul National University's Professor Chung Cheoryong and Professor of Seogang University uh, Choi Jin Seok is also being mentioned as a nominee for the same position. And a strong nominee for the foreign minister position is lawmaker Park Jin. And for the unification minister, former unification deputy minister Kim Chun-sik and lawmaker Kwon Young-se are being mentioned. Uh, There's also a possibility that the nominee for the chief of staff may be uh, announced separately later this week, not tomorrow, along with the 10 ministerial positions. And the leading nominee in consideration for the position is Kim Daegi, who served as former presidential secretary on political affairs. It's interesting. Again, we talked about this before, but uh, some of the cabinet members or nominees are people of uh, certain expertise. Mm -hmm. uh, But uh, they do mix in, obviously, those with uh, some political backgrounds for obvious reasons. But uh, uh, before we move on, Jihee, do you uh, give out autographs and stuff to our listeners? No. <laughs> uh, Jay, Jay Lee says, I still have her autograph. Oh, uh, Joshua. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently Jihee's giving out autographs. I uh, <laughs> never knew this, but maybe I have to get her autograph. <laughs> After the show, uh, in the meantime, South Korea and the U.S. kicking off their preliminary military exercises amid the uh, escalated tensions on the Korean Peninsula. The USS Abraham Lincoln reportedly entered the EC for the first time in over four years. Uh, let's also get more on this. Oh, sure. Sorry. Uh, military sources announced... Thinking it, about the autograph. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to remember. What is, what, I think it's from the doll that he... Uh, for Anyway, uh, so military sources <laughs> announced today that the U.S. nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, uh, USS Abraham Lincoln, entered the eastern waters of the city of Ulsan. Uh, this is the first time the carrier entered the East Sea since November 2017, uh, when North Korea had fired a series of long-range ballistic missiles. Now, this 
Abraham Lincoln is scheduled to stay in the eastern waters for about five days. However, it, it has not been decided whether the aircraft carrier strike group will join the upcoming South Korea-U.S. joint military exercises or conduct naval drills with the South Korean Navy's vessels. Uh, meanwhile, Seoul and Washington began their crisis management staff training exercise led by the South Korean Joint Chiefs of Staff, and it involves simulations of pre-war crisis scenarios. And this exercise comes ahead of their Combined Command Post Training, or CCPT, which will kick off on the 18th of this month and run to the end of the month. Uh, and this comes amid speculations that North Korea may possibly carry out a nuclear test soon. Uh, the CCPT is a computer simulation which may or may not involve the deployment of military assets on the ground uh, based on the Allies' contingency plans in the event of war. And the CCPT was uh, supposed to be held in March, but of course it was postponed due to the South Korean presidential elections and the surge in infections cases of the Omicron variant within the country. That's right. And usually uh, when these military exercises do happen, uh, we do see some kind of uh, military provocation happening from the north. But I think the big one that we're looking at uh, that could potentially happen sometime this month, uh, maybe after the inauguration of Yoon suk yeol is, like you said, the mm -hmm. uh, nuclear uh, testing here. Uh, continuing with the two allies, the United States' top nuclear envoy is slated to make a trip to South Korea next week to coordinate policies related to the Korean Peninsula ahead of, again, the launch of the Yoon Sung-yeol administration. So uh, let's get more on this. Right. So according to sources familiar with South Korea-U.S. ties, Song Kim, U.S. Special Representative for North Korea and other officials in charge of North Korea issues, including his deputy Tong Park, uh, they are expected to visit South Korea around the 18th this month, which would be next Monday and also the day when this whole Washington Combined Command post training kicks off, as T mentioned. And uh, this delegation is expected to stay for around four days. The main purpose purpose is to meet with uh, his South Korean counterpart, No Gyu-dok, as well as officials of the incoming UN administration and outgoing officials as well. Sources say a visit to the Unification Ministry is also in the planning. When meeting with figures of the next administration, Korean Peninsula policy directions are going to be the main focus in continuation from discussions Kim had with No in Washington earlier this month. Key to discussions are likely going to be focused on how to cope with tensions on the Korean Peninsula while South Korea is going through its transition into a new government uh, and possibilities of heightened threats from North Korea are continuously being forecasted, uh, especially as uh, the 110th birthday of late Kim Il-sung, the founder of North Korea, is coming up. And uh, that's also why many experts are predicting another ICBM test or even a nuclear test, as you guys mentioned. Now, whether Kim will get to meet with the president-elect Yoon suk yeol is not known. Meanwhile, the trip comes just a week after a South Korean delegation sent by the president-elect Yoon returned from their week-long trip to the U.S. Upon arrival yesterday afternoon, Yoon's South Korea-U.S. policy consultation delegation told reporters uh, that uh, they are going to thoroughly report on their visit to the U.S. recently to the new administration and also make sure that uh, starting with the uh, first day with the new administration, uh, they will do all their efforts so that for the nation, for the national interest, as well as the safety of the nation's people, and also uh, that the comprehensive strategic alliance with the U.S. will, uh, you know, strengthen even further. Uh, they also mentioned that uh, the two allies are getting prepared for any uh, possible threats from North Korea, uh, with the U.S. having also promised to strengthen its deterrence as well. Yeah, I mean, the consensus right now, according to a lot of the experts I had a chance to uh, speak to, is in some ways the Biden administration is very welcoming of the incoming U.N. administration mm -hmm. because they do have a lot in common. I mean, they're number one hawkish towards North Korea. They're all also hawkish towards the China related issues as well. And so, you know, it's not surprising that this whole eight day trip by the, uh, the de delegation, right, the consultation delegation uh, happening and them trying to improve ties here. Uh, but also, U.S. President Joe Biden is set to visit Japan next month uh, to attend the Quad Summit uh, during his visit to the Asian continent. 
there is a possibility that he may visit South Korea, uh, possibly hold a first summit with President-elect Yoon suk yeol at the time. So, Chi uh, tell us more about this. Sure. So, President Joe Biden is reportedly considering visiting South Korea after the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue meeting, which is a four-nation international cooperative comprising Australia, India, Japan, and the U.S. And this is slated for May 24th and will be held in Japan. Uh, much attention is on Biden's planned visit to Japan as he could visit South Korea shortly after the meeting and hold a summit with incoming President Yoon suk yeol just weeks after his inauguration to be held on the 10th. Uh, if the summit becomes official, it will be Yoon's first meeting with a foreign leader and it will be the fastest ever South Korea-U.S. summit to be held within an administration. Uh, the Reuters reported that President Biden said during his summit with Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi that he looks forward to meeting him again in the upcoming Quad meeting to be held in Japan, which means he will be attending it for sure. And President Biden had invited the South Korean and Japanese leaders to the U.S. for summits after his inauguration last year, but he hadn't uh, visited both the countries yet. You know, I heard something uh, very interesting uh, earlier today, uh, just an analysis on, because, you know, so much attention on whether or not Joe Biden is indeed going to come to South Korea, right, mm -hmm. and meet with uh, President like Yoon suk yeol um, but traditionally, and uh, this is something that uh, I didn't think of when I had a chance to speak to uh, Professor Robert Kelly yesterday for our uh, special there. Traditionally, the South Korean president visits Washington first, mm -hmm. and then the U.S. president would, you know, make a trip to South Korea. That, that's kind of how it goes. I, I you know, I'm not a big fan of that. It almost kind of sounds like, hey, how dare you make me come first? You know, you should come <laughs> visit me first and I visit you afterwards. But in we... the case, uh, if, if Korea has a new president, you mean? No, no, yeah, in the new, in the case that there's a new president. Oh, even other way, way around, if the U.S. has a new president, it's also South Korea yeah. who makes the visit yeah, first? Yeah, mm, okay. so it's, it's always been like that. Mm. And I mean, again, I'm not a big fan of that, but traditionally it happens. But again, we don't know what's going to happen because some are saying that, yeah, it's probably more likely that Yoon suk the very first president that he might actually meet with as president, might be Joe Biden. But if indeed Joe Biden does come to South Korea, and something unprecedented <laughs> happens. It really does show that maybe this eight-day trip by the delegation further improved ties. And, you know, one thing is for sure, the U.S. really wants South Korea to be more leaning towards their side, right? Mm. With the current Moon administration, South Korea was kind of balancing out in between United States and China. You yeah. know, they couldn't do a certain thing with Washington without upsetting Beijing. They couldn't do certain things with Beijing not to upset Washington, but... For sure, with the UN administration, they're more leaning towards, if by, by far, leaning yeah. towards the United States. So it could be possible that uh, Joe Biden does visit South Korea. But again, uh, only speculations at this time. Mm -hmm. But there was also um, some lawmakers in the current administration who have criticized that during those eight days that the delegation did not get to meet with the, the U.S. president. Although then uh, the delegation did mention that uh, currently Joe Biden is really focused on the Ukraine crisis. Yeah, and that was the other thing. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, whether or not, uh, even if there are improved relations with, uh, you know, Seoul and Washington, is Washington going to put more priority on North Korea related issue? It's not the case. Mm. I, you know, Ukraine is number one at this time. That's not going to change. And I don't think, uh, you know, North Korea is even number two because China is going to be number two, right? So even with the meetings, like you said, I mean, there, you aren't going to get a fruitful result. It's going to be just a meet and greet kind of a thing. Once the administration has launched, I think then we're going to be seeing more. Uh, but speaking of Ukraine, uh, you know, the Ukraine crisis certainly hindering South Korea's satellite projects from taking place uh, from what I, I understand. Uh, how are these two issues related, though, Soa? It's because of international sanctions against Russia that are now also impacting South Korea's satellite launches, which depend largely on Russia. Now, South Korea had planned to send off its Arirang-6 or CompSat-6, a multi-purpose Earth observation satellite, as well as the mid-sized compact advanced satellite 500 into space in the second half of this year. We might have talked about these projects earlier in the program uh, before, but it looks like 
like these launches will inevitably be postponed. Now, South Korea's Ministry of Science and ICT said on Tuesday that the situation in Ukraine has made it difficult for these satellites to be launched, and an industry watcher was cited as saying a delay is 80 to 90 percent certain. The Arirang 6 was planned to take off from a Russian developed Angara rocket from a location in northern Russia. The CAS 500, that's the compact advanced satellite 500, uh, was to be launched atop a Russian Soyuz rocket from Kazakhstan. Now, amid Russia's ongoing aggressions in Ukraine, Europe and the U.S. have already suspended space cooperation with Russia. The European Space Agency, for instance, suspended its joint ExoMars program with Russia. And London-based Low Earth Orbit Satellite Communications Company OneWeb decided to make its launch with American Air aerospace company SpaceX. And uh, earlier, it too was supposed to work with Russian uh, Soyuz yeah. um, rockets that South Korea was planning to as well. So, so Seoul's government is also looking for alternative rockets, but it's not going to be an easy task as contracts that have been settled years ago cannot be called off just like that. Uh, according to an expert, Korea may also wait for things to settle down and later continue its cooperation with with Russia. You know what's interesting? It's uh, there's so many things that are impacted by the ongoing uh, crisis in Russia, right? I mean, sorry, in Ukraine, uh, because of Russia, and not to mention because of all these sanctions that are placed uh, on Russia. So I want to kind of get your take on these widely ranging impact on South Korea and, of course, other countries stemming from these sanctions against Russia. I mean, it, it's a double edged sword, right? I mean, you're trying to really push, uh, you know, Russia to stop their invasion, but at the same time, you're all also impacted by this as well. Chihi, let's start off with you. Right. So these impacts, I mean, all the sanctions, they're not directly targeted at uh, the people who have started the war, including Putin. So uh, sanctions like these that affect uh, the spaceship industry of Korea. It's not effective for sure, and it only damages the wrong people and the nation. And I think it's really unfair that uh, the wrong parties are being impacted by these sanctions. And we don't have any fault. We don't have any reason to uh, be postponing our uh, spaceship, the satellite launch. And just because of Russia, I mean, this Russia should really realize that um, it's it's just doing no good to the whole international community in various ways. But sanctions such as these will not uh, make Russia move for sure. Yeah, and to be honest with you, though, I mean, Russia has gone so deep into this war that mm -hmm. I don't think they're going to be turning back, right? Yeah. And that's, that's just the other thing. Uh, so what about yourself? Well, my first impression after reading about uh, this news was the same as uh, Ji Yi. I thought, thought it was really unfair for all the people that are hardly uh, working hard on these space projects here in Korea. In fact, we've been spending some hundreds of millions of dollars in just a year for these uh, space projects. Uh, so it is, uh, it does feel um, kind of unfair. However, I think we should make some of these sacrifices for the time being. And uh, I think although South Korea's government says it's not easy to just suspend all of these projects, but Europe and the U.S are doing that yeah, right now. Yeah. Uh, although it might seem that South Korea is not as much you know, connected to the Ukraine crisis as our European countries or the U.S. But I think right now it really needs the international community's efforts, even though we do have to make those sacrifices. Uh, and um, I think I am on the same page as the uh, expert that I mentioned earlier who said we might just want to delay this project for a while, just wait, and then if something, you know, changes uh, in the Ukraine crisis and uh, uh, Russia Russia and Putin changes as well, then might, we might want to cooperate with Russia again because Russia is a powerhouse when it comes to space development. There is a reason for why yeah, we are using yeah. these rockets in Russia. So, yes, rather than going for other companies right away, I think we might want to just wait and see in the coming months. And, you know, hypocrisy is like one of those things, right? That like you can't be slapping sanctions and then be like, but... 
but when it comes to us, we don't want to get impacted by this. So we'll mm. still use Russian gas. This is what a lot of people are saying. You're putting a lot of sanctions on uh, you know, Russian uh, energy and oil and stuff like that. But you can't be going, but we'll just buy a little bit. We won't buy 100% from Russia. We'll buy a little. That's what a lot of experts are saying. Unless there is a full embargo. I forgot who. One of the former uh, foreign affairs minister. Uh, in Russia, he came out saying that the only way that Russia can be stopped is if there is a full 100% embargo on Russian oil and energy. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, that's never going to happen. It, it's it's almost, I mean, I can't say it's impossible, but it's very difficult considering, again, all the European countries so heavily reliant on Russian energy and oil, right? So. Right. That's exactly it. You, you can't be saying one thing and go the other way. So in, in that case, even though there are some setbacks, I think you need to continue to go uh, with these sanctions in place here. Uh, let's move on now to some uh, COVID-19 updates here. I might have been a little bit too happy early yesterday with the figures mm-hmm. under 100,000, You know, although it was the weekend effect and so forth. We did see the, uh, the numbers rebound to the five-digit range to back six up, digit. a six digit mm-hmm. in fact over two hundred thousand is what we're seeing uh but the number of fatality i think this is the big thing uh, dropping significantly as well also a new variant that's landed in korea is raising a concern so uh, let's get a rundown of this sure so two hundred ten thousand seven hundred fifty five cases uh, were tallied as of 12 a.m this tuesday which means the number has more than doubled from the day before when we had roughly 90,000 infections. Uh, But uh, also today's number marks around 55,000 fewer cases than Tuesday exactly a week ago. So we are still continuing the downward trend. And also the average number of daily cases in the past seven days stands at around 197,000. So for the first time in 38 days, this number has dropped to below the 200,000 level. Also, uh, SJ, as you mentioned, uh, fatalities are dropping. 171 uh, deaths were reported in the past day. Uh, It's still 171 people have lost their lives. It is still a high number. However, for the first time, this number is in the 100 range for the first time in almost a month. And also the number of people in serious or critical condition as of today stands at 1,005, which is down by 94 from yesterday. So I really hope this number goes down to the triple digit figure uh, soon. And uh, meaning there are many positive indices that we are seeing, but there are also some uh, concerns regarding not only people who have not yet been infected, who still have to uh, stay vigilant, but also those who have once been infected should not lose their guards because today the government mentioned how many people have actually been infected twice or even three times. So the percentage of people uh, that have been reinfected since Korea's had its uh, first COVID-19 outbreak stands at Almost 0.3 percent, to put that into numbers, between January 2020 and March 19th this year, there were over 26,000 people who are suspected of having uh, been infected with the COVID-19 virus more than once. Mm. And another concern is the emergence of a new hybrid Omicron variant, the XL variant. It's one of 17 recombinant variants that involve strains of the BA1 and BA2 Omicron strains. And it's been detected in a man in his 40s in Tollanamdo province last month. Now, he has already recovered and is past uh, his um, isolation period. Now, this uh, man was said to had his first infection, had no symptoms, and uh, was even boosted. He had a third shot of COVID-19 vaccination. Uh, and so far, according to the World Health Organization, um, there were 66 cases Uh, in the UK, which had first detected this XL variant back in February. Now, for now, according to Lee Sang-won, an official at the health ministry here in Korea, it's not for sure whether this variant has uh, actually been an imported case or whether it has, uh, you know, 
just emerged within the local community. Yeah. So more research has to be done. Uh, but he does say there is a high chance uh, that this is an imported case uh, because the sequencing uh, and analysis showed that it is pretty similar to what we have seen in XL cases in the UK. Well, I mean, at least it's not like a completely new variant, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, we're not uh, you know naming a new Greek alphabet after the variant. It seems like we're naming it after uh, iPhone models now <laughs> from XA to XS. But uh, it, it's still concerning. Um, but I think the good news is the, the fact that it's not at least according to this one particular patient, you know, that's not a, not a lot of uh, symptoms, but there's already talks, I mean, three shots uh, fully, you know, boosted and still being infected with this new variant. There's already talks of the, the four shots being uh, administered to uh, senior citizens and those in high risk. So now the big question is, I, how many times do we get, you know, vaccinated yeah. before we're considered safe? Uh, you know, and, and a lot of people basically say, I mean, I've already got three shots. I mean, do I really need to get four shots? Do I really need to get fifth shot? Because if you're still going to get infected, what's the point? But I think what they're targeting, the health authorities are high risk groups, senior citizens, because apparently uh, over 20 percent of the new infections are those who are over 60 and then over 80 percent of deaths being reported are those from uh, 60. So. I'm still a firm believer that even though you can get infected, even after you get vaccinated, that, that the symptoms are a little bit better and that you don't die from, I guess, COVID-19, which I think is uh, the most important thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, speaking of vaccines, the COVAX uh, reallocating uh, vaccines for North Korea has been canceled earlier. Chihi, tell us about this. Right. So the COVAX facility initiative, uh, the international group co-leading the vaccine sharing program, had canceled vaccines allocated to North Korea 10 days ago, uh, mainly due to the lack of cooperation from the North side. However, the group confirmed recently that 1.83 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines have been reallocated to the regime. So according to the UNICEF's COVID-19 vaccine market dashboard, uh, the type of vaccine being allocated to the North has not been revealed, and there are no volumes that have completed preparation or are in delivery yet. But anyhow, that much doses of vaccine have been allocated to North Korea. And earlier this year, North Korea had been allocated some 1.28 million doses of uh, the Novavax vaccines, but they have been canceled as the North had not not express their intentions to receive them. Uh, as of now, the only two countries that have not even begun their first round of vaccinations are uh, reportedly North Korea and Eritrea. Do we know why North Korea is uh, not accepting these vaccines? Is it just a uh, purely political or are they trying to prove that there is no COVID-19 in their country and they could never be COVID-19 in their country? So there is no need for vaccine. Um, I, it's 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 weird because it's yeah yeah it's one of those things where I think it's eventually the the citizens who are suffering from all this right mm-hmm. I mean there might be a lot of you know elderly population that might need the vaccines and who knows I'm I'm sure uh, COVID nineteen is still rampant not not as bad as some of the other countries obviously because they're you know closing down the uh, the, the border so much but. Uh, yeah, it, it is interesting to know. Um, not mm-hmm. to mention, I think the other thing that, that they're also required to have uh, if you're going to send them the vaccines is uh, the, the, the cold chain, mm-hmm. uh, the technology, right? Uh, we got some messages incoming from uh, the big fan of uh, Chihi, uh, Josh, saying that uh, in 1920, Spanish flu and COVID repeated history as well. So I don't know what happens. Weirdly. Well, you know, the thing interesting about Spanish flu is that it didn't even start from Spain. It started, it started in like Kansas or something like that. <laughs> so I don't know why they called it Spanish flu. Vaccinations don't stop you from catching it. It keeps your antibodies to better handle it if you get it. I think that's the big thing, mm-hmm. right? Uh, we're, I mean, it's inevitable that we're going to see high figures moving forward, but just not succumbing to the virus, I think is the most important thing mm-hmm. moving forward. I just want to quickly add to the question why North Korea might not want to receive uh, vaccines from the COVAX facility. Oh, using uh, your new no- laptop. Yeah, I yeah. am. Yeah, uh, this just in. <laughs> no, uh, well, I just made uh, some quick research here. It says uh, in one of uh, in a report that North Korea might be concerned about reporting requirements that are needed to participate uh, in the COVAX um, system because uh, uh, North Korea, of course, we know does not want to reveal a lot of yeah, information yeah. of its country and that might be uh, why they, you know, they don't want to be exposed to um, their inside uh, information and that's why maybe they 
do not want to rather not receive those I, vaccines. I mean, I hate to use the phrase uh, you know, understandable, uh, but again, it's once again, the, the citizens kind of, you know, again, the brunt of the, the bad thing here. I mean, because they probably do want the vaccines, but uh, nevertheless, that is an interesting uh, thing to look at there. Thank you very much for that. So, uh, <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> uh, for both of our reporters, uh, Soa and Chi, thank you very much. Uh, there was actually a long conversation about who's lucky of having uh, Chihi's autograph and things like that, people wanting <laughs> autograph golf balls uh that's apparently for some different uh it's different topic we'll talk yeah. about next time but guys thank you very much for your reports stay safe and uh, we'll see you guys again thank see you. you you can listen to korea now with me sj lee by downloading the arirang radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com so make sure you tune in mondays through fridays 6 p.m to 8 p.m korea time